she won't tell us the truth of who she is. We are living with a con artist sociopath. Welcome down the rabbit hole, friends. I've been going through a lot over here, and in order to cope, I've decided to get cozy by the fire and enjoy some sour rings, <laughs> which are my favorite kind of candy, while I deep dive into the Natalia Grace story. Now, a story making headlines around the world. Is this a child or a grown woman? The Barnett's believe it. Yes, it's a really sad story, but it's also utterly ridiculous. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to be snarking on Michael Burnett an awful lot. So join me as we head down this new rabbit hole. I promise you, within five years, someone's dead. Meet Michael Barnett. He annoys me in an awful lot of ways. Um, at first I was like, he really strikes me as someone who's like very, very high functioning on the spectrum. And this makes sense because later we find out that his oldest son is on the spectrum, has um, what they call Asperger's, and his son is really, really cute and adorable. But it all kind of made sense to me in certain ways uh, because Michael does not have a sense of how he's coming off <laughs> to us in this uh, documentary at all, in my opinion. She threatened to stab my sons, drag their bodies outside and bury them under the deck. She tried to poison and kill my wife. Bye bye. So basically, Michael Barnett and his wife, they want to make the argument that the child suffering from dwarfism along with several other medical and psychological impairments who they picked up from, in their own words, a strip mall 24 hours after hearing about her, didn't turn out to be like the most loving, wonderful, stable child they had always hoped for. It's going to kill everybody you've adopted a kid and now they're trying to kill you. I mean, it's the stuff of a horror movie, right? How does something like this happen? Especially to people who put no time, effort, or planning into a full-on adoption. It's just like anyone should be able to cha-ching, ring up their credit card and get the child of their dreams from a strip mall in Florida at any time. And the Barnetts are shocked that that's not what happened for them. If you watch The Orphan, it's just like The Orphan. Okay, so I don't think I've ever shared with you guys that I'm a huge horror movie fan. And yes, I loved The Orphan. I thought it was a super well done horror movie. It came out a few years before all of this went down with Natalia Grace. So the movie came out and then the story reenacted itself in real life. <laughs> Something sounds oddly suspicious to me <laughs> about all of this. Natalia was a victim. The, the Barnett's are the predators. They just literally left her to the wolves. Well, it wouldn't be an Amazon docu-series without someone being like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We have a different opinion on all of this. <laughs> so let's hear what they have to say. Trouble. So regardless of her age, she was left feeling uh, abandoned and neglected, alone. So of course, there are supporters of Natalia Grace who are speaking out and being like, what happened with this family really sucked. And they were the problem, ultimately. Nadalia was a child. I, I know that for sure because I'm a little person. Nadalia, you still need to be on your wall. So are we surprised that the people who showed up at a strip mall with their credit card to adopt a child aren't necessarily the ideal parents behind closed doors? Domestic violence. <laughs> Okay, this is my favorite part of the first episode and my least favorite part, obviously, because what we see is Michael Barnett just like pounding the floor, right? And you're like, what? What's going on? And guess what? There's no explanation. <laughs> I'm guessing maybe we'll find out in a later episode, but like, what is he up to? <laughs> I don't get it. Um, I guess... The director's trying to let us know that Michael has a short temper and in the middle of filming, he decided to punch the ground for a couple, I don't know, hours it seems like. <laughs> Weird. They will do anything to get what they want. There were all these pieces to a puzzle that we couldn't quite put together. Oh man, I am so here for this. <laughs> I've heard about this story before. I've watched other like news broadcasts and documentaries about it, but I've never um, seen this full documentary before. We're going to be going through it, and we're also going to be going through the new one where Natalia speaks. So I'm really excited about all of this. We were all abused. We were all abused. I'm so scared. 
I feel you, Michael. I'm scared too. Scared that I'm going to do this thing that I always do where I stay up really late at night to finish this entire docuseries in one sitting because this is amazing. I'm sorry for you, Michael. I'm actually really sorry for the kids and everything that happened here. I know we all are. Um, but Michael needs some mental health help. <laughs> Michael, I can already see. We need to get you some help, buddy. Um, let's go ahead and continue on and see what Michael is so scared of here. Uh, I hope I don't overstate this and make it seem a little bit too Norman Rockwell American uh, life, but life was fantastic. I, I, it really was. This is okay, this is another one of my favorite parts of episode one because Michael's going to tell us all about like his many amazing Lamborghinis and like McMansions. Life's great. Financially, we're doing great. We've got uh, a literal brand new McMansion. 5,000 square foot home in a prestigious town. Got a driveway loaded with cars in it. And money and all the wonderful things he had and the amazing life he was living because, you know, he's an amazing guy with an amazing family. And it's just like, so why were you punching the floor, Michael? Like, <laughs> what's going on? You're not making me feel any kind of, like, read the room. You're not making me feel sympathetic towards you. <laughs> you had it all and you still um, had to rehome a child in an apartment. We'll find out about that later. But, you know, it's just like, read the room. There's a Lamborghini in my driveway, for God's sakes. We have 13 TVs. We've got 14 couches. Okay, this is my for real, real favorite part of this episode of the documentary. 14 couches. I would love to have 14 couches. Like, that's my dream. My dream home is like a house that is completely crammed full of couches. It's really important that I someday accomplish this in my life because I actually feel that couches are far superior to beds or chairs or like sitting in a car. I just love couches. They're perfect. And I've always had a dream of creating like a double decker, triple decker couch, much like in the Lego movie, but it would also like do other things for me, like all around the house, like kind of like a wheelchair, but in a couch form. So 14 couches, like I can get behind that. The pinnacle of life. Michael loved Christine dearly. When the flowers came for their anniversary, it was a dozen roses for every year they were married. So for their 10... That's too much. That's just too much, like too much waste. I mean, 14 couches, yes, more please. A dozen roses for each year that we were married, that's stupid. Stupid, Michael. Um, and it just makes me think that buying a child from a strip mall isn't the only stupid decision you've made in life. And when we realized our oldest son, Jacob, has Asperger's or autism, we fought those fights. Okay, so their oldest son, Jacob, he's on the spectrum. He's incredibly intelligent. Like, he's given TED Talks, and he was very supported by his parents. They go on to talk about how they created groups and clubs for him to be a part of. They were just, like, really supportive, and he had come so far and gone so far with his hyper-intelligence, so. Was moving through schooling faster than I moved through a pair of shoes. I did not come here to frighten you all with quantum mechanics. Not yet. <laughs> you know, an amazing kid. And he's really cute on here, and we get to know him as an adult as well. And I really have a lot of respect for this guy, a lot of sympathy and empathy for him. And it really looks like, I, I just can't say anything negative about this kid. Lots of, for the most part, good things going on here. And I'm really sad for what happened to him and his family in this situation. The Barnetts say that they were contacted by a random adoption agency in Florida who let them know that they had 24 hours to get this extremely special child. The adoption agency had received their packets about wanting to become parents. They thought they were amazing people and they would be great with this child with special needs who had dwarfism. But they only had 24 hours to make this happen. And if they don't do it in 24 hours, then they will lose their chance to adopt this amazing miracle of a daughter. The Barnetts were like, hell to the yes. 
and supposedly they jumped in their car and drove down to Florida to pick her up. They were shocked when they arrived and realized that the adoption agency was in a strip mall. But that didn't cause them to think twice or ask further questions. Instead, they entered the strip mall, filled out the adoption paperwork, and waited patiently for Natalia to arrive. About 20, 30 minutes go by, and we can see the door open, and we can see the other family leave. Because she was adopted before. This is her family that adopted her the first time. All right, so they're at this strip mall adoption agency. And through like a hole, like the keyhole in the door, he says that they're watching and they see this other family arrive with her, drop her off and just exit. And they're sitting there like, oh my God, this perfect, wonderful child. She she just got dropped off. How could they do this? How could they do this to her? It never occurred to them to be like, none of this is adding up. All of this seems really strange and weird and inappropriate. And maybe we should ask some further questions. I feel like maybe at this point they should have asked Jacob what he thought, because he seems to be the most intelligent one operating in this family. Natalia's left behind. They had flown in, dropped her off, flew out. The door opens. Natalia's right there. She comes running in. She got this big smile on her face. She's happy as can be. And she's shouting, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy. Okay, yes, this is a huge red flag. I don't know if I should expect the Barnetts to get this or not. I think a lot of people would have researched more like what adoption means and what can happen with a child who is coming from um, certain circumstances. I don't know. I mean, it just seems like they are clueless. But when a child is literally dropped off by a family that had adopted them before and they immediately run into your arms screaming, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, with a big smile on their face and no reaction to the other family leaving them behind. This is a major red flag, red flag. Okay. This is likely a child that is unable to attach to people around him or her. It's called RAD. It's something that um, most people would know about when they were getting ready to adopt. Reactive attachment disorder. It's important to be aware of these terms and the many psychological effects that come along with many children who've been through the system and eventually get adopted. I've seen it so many times before, um, especially working as a psych nurse on psych units. We often, often, I'll be talking about this throughout this series have cases where we are dealing with children of adoptions and their families who are struggling a lot especially the siblings the fun times i can remember with natalia are pretty much from that first week where we were in florida we went with natalia to disney world so right after the adoption the barnett's immediately like drive natalia and her new brothers over to Disney World, right? To have this big family vacation and they have a good time and they have a lot of fun. And I hear a shout from the bathroom. This was a, I'm not playing around, come here right now, Michael, shout. But back to real life, because once they get home and they, and they start trying to settle Natalia into her new family, her new life, um, some weird things start happening. Like, for example, Christy goes to give Natalia a bath. Natalia is supposed to be six years old, and Christy immediately notices that she has pubic hair. All right. I will say that the reaction they describe to all of this in this documentary, like, really kind of rocks my world. Allegedly, according to Michael, like, Christy was like shouting for him to come. They both had to look at her and see that she had pubic hair in the tub. That seems like someone who doesn't know what they're doing when it comes to taking care of children and any kind of special needs children. This is a child who has dwarfism. She's going to grow differently. Um, she has medical issues. She's coming from an adopt an adoptive situation. You've been told that she's coming from a different country. It should not completely shock you that there might be some things going on with her that just don't necessarily happen with other children, okay? I can understand questioning it. I can definitely understand questioning it. I can definitely understand going to a doctor to talk about it. I can definitely understand talking about it with your spouse like in the bedroom at night when you're alone. But to be like, Michael, Michael, get in here! And then you both have to stand over her and inspect her. I mean, your responses to these situations clue us in that you were not ready to deal with any kind of imperfect situation. 
I mean, I think you really were not getting what you wanted from this kid. Um, and it's not just about all the behavioral problems. There was a day I came home from work. Christine's got a pair of Natalia's underwear. Christine asked Natalia to tell me what's going on. The Barnetts also end up finding out that Natalia is getting her period, okay? So this upsets them as well. And once again, I think like there could be medical reasons why this is happening. I have seen it happen in special needs kids in my own practice as a nurse at a pretty young age. Um, I would say I've definitely seen six-year-olds with pubic hair before. And I just have to say that one major issue that I have with the way that this is discussed on the documentary is like, why is Christy holding up like dirty underwear in front of Natalia and her newly adopted father and asking Natalia to explain what's going on here? That seems odd to me. That doesn't seem like something that's healthy. Are you shaming her for like having her period? I understand that you have questions and you're worried. These are things that you talk about with your husband behind closed doors. You talk to a doctor about before you approach the child and try to make them feel bad about it. Like there's just something that's off with the way that Christy is dealing with these situations. But one of the main issues I can really understand them being concerned about is that when they realize Natalia is having her period, they also realize that she's been specifically hiding it from them. She's been going through this ritual of cleaning herself up and then throwing whatever she's using out the window like she didn't want them to know. And I do think that in that kind of situation, you would be questioning, like, why does she have this thought process of not wanting us to know? Now, it's highly likely that a child who's doing something like that has been shamed or treated inappropriately, maybe sexually. Those are the things I would be thinking and I would be looking for. And I would be taking her to a doctor and a psychiatrist to figure all of this out. Natalia, tell that happened. Okay. But as we move on from this, we realize that Natalia Grace is also having major behavioral problems in the home. And that's when we start to witness her dark side. And then she would do her best to urinate on him. She would defecate in the car and put her hand into it and try to smear it on Ethan. Yeah, it was a frequent occurrence for Natalia. She's doing things like defecating or urinating on herself. She'll sometimes smear it on surfaces or try to smear it on someone else. She steals her brother's toys and will do things like leave them in the middle of the road. Now, Michael says that he thinks she wants her brothers to run out in the road and get hit by a car. But I mean, how can you really, it, you don't know what Natalia was thinking. But I understand why he would say that because we also have Natalia collecting knives under her bed and showing up in her parents' bedroom in the middle of the night holding a knife. She tells them that she has bad thoughts and she even says that she thinks about killing people. She was doing as many things as possible to cause hurt or harm or mental distress to the entire family. She's been with us for about five or six months at this point. And at this time, my boys are six, nine, and 11. Natalia's case, like, it's gained an awful lot of notoriety because everybody associates it with the orphan and her parents did like something really extreme. Um, but it is not unusual for people who adopt children to encounter some of the major behavioral issues we're going to hear the Barnetts talk about. It is not unusual for those people to have to turn around and take these children to psych hospitals, facilities, searching out help and having to battle to keep their homes safe for other siblings. This doesn't mean that Natalia didn't deserve to be adopted. This doesn't mean that these kids don't deserve to find good and loving homes, but it does mean that people need to be educated about the potential ramifications of going through with adoptions. And I just don't understand if the Barnetts even took any of this into account. It's who come into the hospital on the psych unit who have been adopted, especially from foreign countries who are dealing with things like fetal alcohol syndrome and other medical issues. Many of them have RAD, which is again, reactive attachment disorder, and also additional psychiatric conditions, such as psychopathy, a lot of these kids have grown up in really harsh situations, even if they entered their parents' new home as a baby or a young toddler. 
the lack of care, interaction, and love that they received early on can affect them for a lifetime. These parents and families, they often have a hard road ahead. And many times these children spend extended stays at the hospital with us. And we may even be looking for long-term care facilities for many of them. So Natalia's case, although of course it is kind of unusual in many ways, there are lots of other families out there who have dealt with these kinds of behavioral issues in children they've recently adopted. So there's so much going on here. This is just episode one of this series. We need to check in. There's so many more secrets down this rabbit hole. So I hope you'll join me again tomorrow when we'll take a look at the curious case of Natalia Grace, episode two.